Hello, good afternoon. Today is Friday, June 10th, and I'm recording this presentation on cybersecurity essentials. And this is one of the first lectures that I give, uh, I present to all of my classes, uh, cybersecurity classes to get the students uh, up to speed on cybersecurity. And so I'm recording it uh, today because next Friday is the first day of class for me for my for the internship student high school student internships i've got 26 students i believe registered for my summer class it's actually something it's a volunteer work and i do it pro bono and so i'm really looking forward to the students it's going to be given virtually and so this is the first presentation uh, first lecture and so what we will do is the students will listen to the lecture uh, during the week, the lectures, and then Friday, most Fridays, and if, if it's not Friday, I will give another day, we will meet and, uh, and discuss the lecture. Okay, so this is going to be cybersecurity essentials. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so this is a very long lecture, by the way. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to, it'll take around two, two hours. And, and so the students will get a copy of this lecture. Uh, and I'm trying to, sometimes it takes even longer than two hours, but I'm going to try and finish it in two, two and a half hours. So it's about 140 um, uh, US uh, Dallas time, central daylight time. So if it's two hours, we'll finish by 340. We should hopefully finish by four o'clock. Okay, so cybersecurity essentials. So what I'm going to talk about, 96 charts, by the way. So what is cybersecurity? What is CIA? CIA, we generally say Central Intelligence Agency, but it is not. Then I talk about 10 major modules in cybersecurity. Okay, modules of or in cybersecurity. And these 10 modules were part of the CISS. CISSP, Cybersecurity Information Security Professionals, uh, Information System Security, let's see. It's a certification for Information System Security Professionals. It's a very good certification to have. And I took this certification in 2010, and it was 10 modules at the time, and I passed. And I had that certification until 2016. We got to renew, and then, uh, some or other I didn't renew, and so I lost that certification. You got to renew, renew by teaching and giving credits and so on, uh, getting credits. So, but in any case, I, I had the certification for six years. And now, you know, you have to take the exam all over again if I want to get uh, the certification again, if I, if I have not kept up with the renewals. And so what happens, it's a, a six hour exam with 250 multiple choice questions. It's a very, very detailed, exam. Anyway, uh, the reference, excellent reference, all in one exam guide, eighth edition was uh, Sean Harris. She's the lady who wrote all the previous editions. Unfortunately, she passed away just before the book was published. So for the last edition, she also has a, uh, as a co-author, Fernando Maimi. So that was published in 2018. And the number of modules are slightly changed in the latest version. So I'm sticking to what I what I uh, studied back in, uh, you know, back in 2010. And so there's also an organization, ISC Squared. Uh, it's a very well-known cybersecurity organization. And they are the ones who um, uh, provide, uh, you know, support and lectures and so on. So I took the lecture, I took the lectures. And so this, this uh, presentation also has been influenced by the lecture notes on CISSP uh, by ISC squared. And remember the lecture notes I'm presenting today, the lecture, uh, it should be used only for education purposes. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the introduction. Now, what is CIA? We think CIA is confidentiality, Integrity, just a second, I want to make sure that we have, uh, just a second, that, oh, just a second, I have got, 
Oh, that's fine. I was I wasn't sure whether whether my mic was on because one one time I recorded, mic wasn't on. I had to re-record. Okay. So security traditionally has been about CIA. CIA is confidentiality, protecting the secrets, integrity, ensuring the data is not maliciously corrupted, and availability because you can jam the system and the system will not be available to anyone. Okay. Uh, I've got to close make this sound go away. I've got another machine here and the sound is always, whenever I get an email, there's a sound. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. So security also now includes trustworthiness, quality, data quality, privacy, but they, they all can be couched in terms of CIA. Trustworthiness is part of integrity and quality. Privacy is also a part of confidentiality, right? Secrecy. Dependability also includes security, reliability, fault tolerance. It has to be dependable. Otherwise, you cannot have availability. So initially, the term, when I got into computer cybersecurity, it was called computer security, CompuSec. OK, that was in the 1980s. Then it became InfoSec, information security, to include data and networks. And now with the web, it's cybersecurity. OK, CIA confidentiality, preventing from unauthorized disclosure, integrity, preventing from unauthorized modification, and availability, preventing denial of service. I mean, denial of service means you get a service, system is so slow, or system has crashed because somebody has attacked the system, and that's denial of service. Okay, so these are the 10 modules, right? So we have information security and risk management. Typically, this module would be taught in a business school in detail one entire semester. Security architecture and design, it's very much a computer science related subject. Cryptography could be taught in computer science or mathematics. Access control, uh, telecommunication security, more like network security, anything to do with lawyer, lawyers, like sometimes data privacy goes into this, uh, regulations, compliance, investigations, digital forensics, and so on physical and environmental security. That's mainly to do with the, uh, just a second, that is mainly to do with the, somebody is doing. Okay, that is mainly to do with the, sorry about the interruption. Um, okay, so yeah, so physical environmental like fire hazards and lighting, so it's external, okay. Business continuity planning, once a system crashes or once your system goes down or, or once the, you know, it can be hit by hurricane, your, your building, everything is crashed like Katrina or 9-11, you need to have backup planning. And then, of course, there's operation security day to day, putting patches and typically what, what people will do. There's an IT person in school, IT person in, um, IT person in uh, uh, university. Right, so they come and put our patches, make to make sure that all our uh, components, all our systems are up to date. And then database application security. That's my area. I started my career in 1985 in cybersecurity, and I worked in database security. And now my work is integrating cybersecurity and machine learning. We just discuss the last four topics under other aspects. So every every module, right? Could take one semester. So I'm trying to compress everything, right? Last four, I'm sort of uh, compressing, but much of our focus in this class, because since I'm, I'm, an ex I'm sort of considered an expert in on the integration of data and cyber and machine learning. So I'll focus on some of those topics, right? Because we've got what, about 10, 12 lectures. So we want to maximize. Okay, so topics that we have not included, some of the recent developments, which I will be talking, cloud computing security, social media security, trustworthy machine learning, uh, secure internet of things, and so on. So we'll be having lectures on those aspects as well. Okay, fine. So now the next one, what is, oh, okay. So we'll start with the first, first topic, information governance and risk management, typically in business schools, right? So here we talk about security management, administration governance, Things like what are the policies, standards, guidelines, procedures, information classification, because information is at different levels. What are the roles and responsibilities? How do you do risk analysis? And what are the best practices? 
Okay, by the way, I'm going to send you this presentation together with a link to the lecture as soon as I finish it today. Uh, so, information security, ISEC or InfoSec, describes activities, right, that relate to the protection information and information infrastructure assets against the risk, loss, misuse, and so on. Remember, if there is no risk, that means if your system is perfectly secure, and if there are no bad people, then you don't have to worry. But unfortunately, the world has bad people, the hackers, and the systems are not 100% uh, secure, right? Systems are faulty. So that's the problem. So information security management describes controls that an organization needs to implement to ensure uh, sensibly managing those risks. The risk to these assets can be calculated by analysis of the following issues, like threats to the assets. What are the threats? These are unwanted events that could cause deliberate or accidental loss, like hackers or what else? Um, hurricanes and whatever. Vulnerabilities, how susceptible your assets are to the attacks. So if we have a system that is very insecure, then of course it's vulnerable, right? And if you have a home built in a very earthquake or hurricane prone area, then you are vulnerable. And the impact, what is the impact of the attack on your system? the magnitude of the potential loss, also calculated in terms of dollar amounts. What's the impact of a hurricane on your home, earthquake on your home? So that's what we are meaning, right? Security man. So it's all under management, administration, and governance. So governance is this whole area called security governance, and I'll talk about it maybe in, the, in a future lecture. Policy standards guidance, right? So what are the policies? top tier of formalized security documents, examples, you can have a policy, all emails must be encrypted. Or I can have a policy, all of the students must be present in house, sorry, in person. Standards are tactical documents because they lay out specific steps or processes retired, required to meet a certain requirements. So if you say all emails must be encrypted, we can say use AES 256 standard for the encryption. A baseline is a minimum security level, right, of a system, network, or device. So TCSEC, and I'll explain to you what TCSEC, Trusted Computer Systems Evaluation Criteria, it says that systems should have a minimum, C2 is a particular level of security, right? You must have at least a minimum level. Like we can tell you, you should have at least a grade of B. That's the minimum level for you to continue with your education. A guideline is a recommendation. It'll be good for you to encrypt, not a policy. A procedure is a detailed, in-depth, step-by-step document, exactly like how do you implement AE-256 in your emails or in your messages, okay? So these are, uh, okay, so these are the policy standards guidelines. So information classification, remember, not all information is public, right? There could be secrets today, we can get, a, there's a secret that President Biden is actually maybe traveling to, um, let's say Russia, right? But you want to keep it a secret. Okay, so that piece of information could be top secret. Or we could even give cover stories and say, President Biden is actually traveling to, to the UK or France. A system of classification should ideally be simple to understand. So you don't want to have, 100 different security levels, right? In the military, they have top secret, secret, confidential, unclassified. Top secret is at the top, then secret, then confidential, then unclassified. Company security levels could be company proprietary. Other levels could be public or private. So different types of classification levels. Okay. Roles and responsibilities. Some I'll sort of skip very quickly. You can read and understand there are internal roles like executive management, security professionals, data system owners, operational staff, users, legal compliance, privacy officers, and so on, OIT at UTD. External roles are people like vendors and suppliers, contractors, temporary employees, and so on. So internal roles for us professors and students are also internal, right? Our students, but uh, we have external roles. So, so in this particular case, for, wise, for the high school students, you are not part of UTD, so you'll be considered more external. Human resources, human employee development and management, hiring, firing, and all kinds of stuff. They do. Okay, so risk management and analysis. So again, I've 
mentioned most of the important stuff. Risk is really the likelihood that something bad will happen, right, and causes harm. And life is a risk, right? I mean, I, I'm planning, after this, I'm planning to go and get some stuff done, and I'll be taking the car, and I don't know what's the risk, right? Some drunk driver could come and crash into me, right? So that's a risk. A vulnerability, and even if I'm at home, it doesn't mean that uh, I'm safe. An airplane could crash into my home, right? A vulnerability is a weakness that could be used to endanger or ca cause harm to an information asset. A threat is anything. A vulnerability is a weakness, right? If you are in a hurricane prone zone, uh, or if your system systems are never completely secure. A threat is anything man-made or act of nature. So hackers could be threats. The likelihood that threat will use a vulnerability to cause harm. So if the attackers say, oh, I'm going to turn to religion and I'm not going to attack, then we can have all the vulnerabilities. We won't have a problem, right? So threat is actually the likelihood that the threat will use a vulnerability to cause harm. That is when we have a risk. Right. So if you are not in a hurricane prone zone, then that's fine. That may be fine. But if you are in a hurricane prone zone, then we are risking. We are at risk. When a threat does use vulnerability to inflict harm, there's an impact. Right. In the context of information security, impact of loss is what? CIA, con loss of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and other losses, loss of income, loss of lives, and so on. It should be pointed out that there is, it's not possible to identify all risks. You cannot in life eliminate all risks. That means I could move from a hurricane prone zone to a zone that has never had hurricane. That doesn't mean the zone will never have hurricane, right? So I want to do everything I can, minimize the risk and the remaining is residual risk. So a risk assessment is carried out by people in, a, in an organization from different departments and they could do qualitative analysis uh, using things like scenarios. If this happens, then this is the case, this happens, this is the case. And then quantitative. So I understand quantitative analysis better. That's assigning numbers and looking at the cost. So once we have con conducted, conducted everything and then and determine what the risks are and so on, uh, then you can talk to the executive management. They can decide, do I ignore? Or maybe I could take some insurance. And so if you have told, the, if you should present the insurance company, all the, all the information, and also um, if you can tell the company that, you know, there's very little risk, then you could get less insurance. So for example, those like IBM and so on, they haven't had really attacks, but Marriott and Target, they have had attacks. So their risks are higher. Okay, so, so risk management, this is from the CISSP notes. Mm. Uh, estimate the potential loss. So you have to calculate. Um, okay. So uh, estimate potential loss. So single loss expectancy. How much are you losing? Right? So uh, the value, the asset value, whatever your computer is, that's going to be attacked, right? The attack value times exposure factor. So that means if you are, if the, if the threat is higher, then it's a higher exposure factor. If you are in a hurricane prone zone, it could be 90%. If you are not, it could be 10%. So what is the loss expectancy? The value is $100. Exposure, exposure factor is 90. Then it's 900. Exposure factor is 90%. Then its uh, asset value is uh, 100. It's 90%. Then I don't know, is 900 or is it 90? Is it 0.9? Anyway, if the asset value is 10, then it's much less. So you conduct threat likelihood analysis. How many times is it happening in a year, right? How many times are you going to be hit with a hurricane or hit with a tax? And then calculate annual loss expectancy is annual loss expectancy is the single loss, say $10 times annual rate 12 times, 120. Your, your asset value is 100 it will take $120 to repair. So then what do you do, right, to replace? So then you can make informed decisions. If it's taking very little to replace, like $10, uh, then is it worthwhile for you to, you know, get insurance? So these are some of the, some of the things that you can, uh, an organization has to think about. Okay, so the security best, best practices, 
like job rotation, like you can work as a bank teller and then work as a customer rep in the bank. You don't let one person control everything, right? Because then the likelihood of cheating and attacking and so on is higher. Separation of duty, that means one job, multiple people carry it out, give some security awareness training, give some ethics education. So these are some things that you will be doing. Okay, so that finishes one module, very briefly, right? That's the administration, so the whole part of managing, setting up policies and so on. That's the governance, right? The, so the governor of our country is the president of the United States and each state has a governor. Each company has a CEO, he, has, he or she has to govern, right? And so similarly, security, there's also governance for security, right? The security, inf security inf chief sec information security officer, right? Could be responsible together with the CEO. So that's typically they talk, talk a lot about that in business schools. Now we get to the more technical part, security architecture and design. So we'll talk about computer architecture, operating system, system architecture, security architecture, security models, and so on. Okay. So computer architecture, you have the central processing unit, you have the registers, memory units, input output processor, single processor, multi-processor, multi-core architectures, grids and clouds. So I'm expecting, I know you're high school students, but uh, you can read up on that. CPU is that single thing in the, you know, that controlling everything is the heart of the computer. There are memory units, there are registers, input output to input data, output data. So a system could have just one processor, a system could have multiple processors, and then you can pack multiple processors into a chip that is a multiple architecture. There are also grids and clouds. Okay, so for the lack of time, I'm sort of very briefly, you can go and read up on these things. So it's not really part of security. Okay, for operating systems, uh, again, there is a memory management. You've got to manage all the memory in the operating systems. There's also managing the process. Um, there are several processes acting, uh, operating in the, I mean, active, active in the system, managing the files because files store the data. There are capability domains. That means people have, have some kind of capability to carry out some actions. And then there's these virtual machines. These are not real machines, but you know, if you want to, uh, get more computing power, you can virtually add machines, but they really make use of the physical machine, really. But that sort of enhances performance. Okay. These are things you will learn in operating systems. In systems architecture, what you what you learn typically in a software engineering class, they will teach you the software components that make up the system. So, like the middleware, that is the bus that integrates as a middleware that connects the database systems, the networks, the applications everything is integrated, right? Then you have the networks, you have the databases, you have the applications like emails and social media, whatever the applications you want to host, okay? That's a system architecture. Because once, you know, remember, in the real world, when you are building applications, there are no standalone systems. Systems are all put together from the components, okay? Now we go to security architecture because Every component in the system, whether it's a database or whether it's an operating system, whether it's, a, uh, whether it's the application, there are some parts of the system that are security critical. What do we mean by that? They provide, say, access control, and we'll talk about access control in the next unit, okay? So these are the security critical components that provide security critical features, controlling access, uh, or, uh, you know, various are ensuring the data, you know, data quality checks, data high integrity. So all those important checks have to be uh, verified, right? Thoroughly tested. But you can, it's very expensive to test everything. That's why we have all these bugs, right? So what people do, companies, they test the very essential parts, security critical components, and you want to make it small because if, if everything is security critical, nothing is going to be sec secure, right? So you want to make that security, so attack surface, you want to make it very small so that you can verify, okay? So that part of the system, the entire computer system, whether it's hardware or software, remember one thing I didn't mention earlier, and I'm not going to talk about it, there's also hardware security, 
right? That's not a module of CISSP. <clears throat> the hardware, like the registers and the memory units, they have to be secured too. So we have people in electrical engineering department who are doing hardware security. Okay, so we have trusted computing base. So trusted computing base is that part of the system that is that has to be security critical. So your system consists of an operating system, a database system, applications and networks and the middleware. A small part of the middleware, a part of the application, a part of the database, a part of the operating system, a part of the networks and part of the applications. Okay, they all have to be security critical. You combine all those little pieces and that is your trusted computing base. Now, cybersecurity started off with operating system security. So that part, so remember, every little piece of component in your system does security functions, and that's part of the TCB. Operating system TCB has a special name because we all started off with operating system TCB. It is called a reference monitor or a security kernel. Okay, that part of the operating system. Okay, the security part of the operating system is called a reference monitor or security kernel. Security perimeter <clears throat> is where within that perimeter, right? That, that's sort of the, you put the dot lines and say outside this, okay, you could have the unsecure applications, but inside the security per perimeter, everything in there should be, uh, should be secure. Security policies, you can have policies like all the emails have to be encrypted and least privilege. When you are in doubt, Right. So if a user is given more access by one, uh, one administrator, less access by another administrator, give the user the least privilege. Don't give him or her anything more than what he needs to do the job. And that's need to know. Okay. So here we are talking about trusted computing base, right? I talked about it. I'm just giving uh, more details. And I've already talked about it. The set of all hardware, firmware, software that are critical for security. The goal is to reduce the size of TCB. I mentioned that. In operating systems architecture, that TCB is really critical because that's like the heart, okay? And so then you have from the heart, you can go to the lungs and you can go to various other, other, other organs, right? So that's that part, the TCB of the operating system has to be small, it has to be fully tested, verified. So that's a reference, called a reference monitor or security kernel. Reference monitor verifies that the request is allowed by access control. There are policies and the reference monitor will check. Is it allowed? One thing to note here is the following. Uh, you can verify by doing extensive testing, but for very high assurance, absolutely, if the system has to be tamper-proof, then you have formal methods, top-notch, you know, PhD mathematicians, many of them, they work on for formal verification and that's quite expensive, right? So, so reference monitor has to be verified. Now, there are different security models. I'll only mention one, Bella Padula. That's the first thing we studied in Security 101 when I was in, when I was, got, when I got into security. BIBA is an integrity model, Clark Wilson, information flow, non-interfering, lots of models have been developed. So these are mainly for military level security, right? So to determine whether specific access mode is allowed, right? Uh, clearance of a subject is compared to classification of the object. So all the users are cleared. We are cleared at unclassified, that means no clearance, confidential, secret, top secret. Unclassified is bottom, and then confidential, then secret, then top secret. Similarly, data, there's top secret data, unclassified data, confidential data, uh, secret data, okay? Clearance classification schemes expressed in terms of lattice. Lattice, in this case, is strictly one thing, unclassified, secret, top secret, and so on. But you can have unclassified data. It can, it can sort of uh, break into US secret, UK secret, or DOD secret, intelligence secret. And then it can go up to top one top secret. It's a lattice diagram. But for us, we can say, you know, it's like a straight line, unclassified, then confidential, then secret, then top secret. Okay. So the model defines two, two policies, two, okay, two rules for mandatory security. That's the map. It has to be satisfied uh, by the enforced by the system. <coughs> and discretionary security, it's up to the owner of the person, owner of the data. Okay. 
So, and we'll study discretionary security in the next, next unit, right? Discretionary security use of an access matrix to specify discretionary access control. So like John has access to certain data, Jane does not ha have access to certain files, Peter has access to certain other files, that's discretionary. But simple security says the following, a subject at a given security level can read or cannot read anything above its level. So it can read everything at or below its level. Its level, no read up. So if you are cleared at secret level, then you cannot read top secret information. You can read secret, confidential, unclassified, anything below you. So that is a system enforced security policy and it's called mandatory, right? No read up, that makes sense. The second one is a little bit tricky. No write down, just the opposite. A subject at a given security level, a secret subject, must not write to any object at a lower security level. It cannot write into a confidential file or an unclassified file. Of course, it can write into a file in its own level, secret file, but it can also write into a file at the top secret level. Sorry, yeah, it can, it can write up. It cannot write down. So you may say it's absurd. It's writing up. It writes up here, but it cannot read what it wrote because no read up. And from a security point of view, they say that's fine because at that time, they were only concerned about confidentiality. Users should not get anything that's above their level. So why do we have the star property? Remember, this is what happens uh, because what happens is that, um, yeah, that you can't trust everything in the system, right? Because all these processes, if you are trusting, you will never get the system out. So some of, lot of the user processes could be malicious, right? They could be attacked, they could have Trojan horses, they could have viruses and so on. However, right, the star property, so you can have a secret process that is malicious. If you allow it to write up, Okay, no, it can write up. If you allow it to write down, and sorry, the secret process can write down, but remember it has got secret information because it can read all the files up to secret level. So it still has secret information. And what it can do if it's writing down, it can write the secret information into the unclassified files or the confidential files. Later, an unclassified user can get the uncl unclassified data. A confidential user can get the confidential and unclassified data. Along with that, there will be the secret, secret data that the secret user maliciously wrote down. So if you allow write down, then malicious processes can write all kinds of things down. Similarly, you can say malicious process, secret process can write all kinds of things up into a top secret file, but it doesn't matter. Why? Secret process, the, because of the simple property can never, will never have access to uh, top secret data. So whatever it's writing will have to be either secret, unclassified or confidential. So it's fine, it can write whatever it wants, right, it wants, but uh, it's not there's, no, not, there's not going to be a confidentiality violation. However, the secret process can write garbage into the top secret file. You know, instead of writing, uh, I, I like to eat uh, chicken today for lunch, you can say, oh, I want to get, uh, you know, beef for lunch, as a silly example, right? You can write all kinds of wrong information, right? Instead of saying, I have the flu, it says, oh, she has the COVID, right? So all kinds of bad information you can write. But it, at that time, we were not concerned about integrity in the CIA because I got into cybersecurity in 1980s, 85. And this kind of work was really started in the 1970s. So at that time, the number one concern was our secrets not going to the hands of the adversary. And by implementing this, you know, adversary could get wrong information, but adversary cannot get, uh, you know, cannot get uh, any information that he or she is not authorized to know. Okay, so confidentiality is preserved. So think about this, okay? We can discuss this if you have questions next Friday. The discretionary security property, I talked about it, right? You have access control matrix, okay? 
So you can operate a system very, I'll do it very briefly, uh, different security modes of operation. It can be dedicated, it can have a dedicated system or system high, everything runs at the highest level. Compartmented level, you break the, you have different, different compartments that are not talking to each other, right? You can have a compartment A, compartment B, compartment C. Then you have, so typically when you have compartments like US uh, secret for the DOD, secret for the another organization, NSA, secret for the CIA, these are all in different compartments. Multi-level is one I mentioned to you, right? Unclassified, secret, confidential. Of course, everything depends on trust and assurance. How much do you trust, okay? How much do you trust these systems? Fine, so once you have built a system, everybody can claim, I've got a, every vendor, I've got this perfect system. Somebody has to evaluate. Typically, a nonprofit company, that's a research lab I was working for before I joined UT Dallas, it's a FFR, this federally funded research uh, lab, carries out the evaluation. We're typically a private nonprofit company. Various criteria, or, you know, so, okay, so they have to be impartial. There's been various criteria. Once a product is evaluated, then you can say, okay, you know, IBM, your product is evaluated. All the testing is carried out and so on. And then the senior management, okay, once it's evaluated, it has to be, then you bring it into your organization. Uh, so IBM as a product, it's evaluated. You bring IBM product into your company like UTD, and then you accredit, uh, you, you first um, certification, certify it that it can be used, okay, uh, with all your other systems, and then senior management will accredit it. That's the process. Okay, but how do you evaluate, right? I mean, you have to give it a rating. So somebody has to come up with some guidelines. So, or criteria. So, the Department of Defense came up with TCSEC, Trusted Computer System Eva Evaluation Criteria. That was called the Orange Book to evaluate operating systems. And then that book was interpreted for networks, Purple Book, sorry, databases, Purple Book, and there was a Green Book, there was a Red Book, Rainbow Series. Initially issued in 1983 and then updated in 1985, okay? Uh, National Computer Security Center, a, a part of NSA. Okay, so while we were doing all this in the US, uh, the Europeans were doing their own thing, right? So France, Germany, uh, Holland, Netherlands, United Kingdom, they developed ITSEC, E1 to E6, their levels. So our levels here were like C1 and above, uh, sorry, D, C, B, A. D, D, and then C1, C2, I think B1, B2, B3, and A1 is the highest level. Okay, uh, so I should, have, I should have mentioned that here, and I'm going to mention it, okay? So the levels are, what the levels are here before I send it to you. Okay, so then they said, uh, okay, first of all, what, what the US did, okay, federal criteria. So the, the, the orange book was mainly for the DOD. Other parts of the government, NIST and NIH and various other parts of the government said, we want something too. So they came up with the criteria called federal criteria. Okay, so expanded TC sec but federal criteria. And then they said, we have this European thing. We have the US thing, why don't we merge? And now we are using the common criteria, EAL1 to EAL7. So one system of IBM, product of IBM could get EAL6 product of, uh, say, Oracle could get EAL3, whatever, security level rating. Okay. So, and then there are these security threats. I'll talk about some attacks later. Buffer overflow, I'll talk about it. Uh, uh, there's another lecture I'm going to give you all, okay, next week. And that's buffer overflow. So next week, I'm going to give you all, after 17th, I'm going to give you all many lectures to, to I've, I've already got the YouTube videos there. So I'm going to host this on YouTube soon. So buffer to, uh, tonight. So buffer overflow, and we are going to have a complete lecture on that. So essentially what happens when your program is executing, it's and a subroutine is called, it has to go to another program, it's putting all, your, all its stuff, variables and data into a buffer, goes and executes a program, comes back, takes the stuff in the bu buffer, from the buffer, and continues executing. But while it's doing the execution in the other program, a malicious software can come and mess up the buffer. So when it comes back and picks up from the, from the buffer, 
the useful information is gone. It's all garbage. So the program has garbage now and it's crashing. That's a buffer overflow. And we're going to talk about the maintenance hooks is when you are designing the system, what happens is some people, <coughs> some people, the designers can collude with people who are going to use and put these hooks in there so that the users can exploit. Time of check, time of use. So when you log in, you, you are given access, but somebody has gone and changed it. And so while you are using it, you don't have access, but because you have logged in, you are still using it. So time of check versus time of use. And once anything has changed, it has to be reflected. So you should not be able to access the data, even though you were allowed in the beginning. Okay, so now I finish number two. Okay, second unit. And that is cryptography. So how are we doing with time? That's fine. We are into about 40 minutes now. Okay. I think I can finish it in two hours, but uh, uh, okay. So let's see how we do it. So we had 28 charts. I've got 96 charts. I don't know. I mean, I'm being a bit optimistic for two hours, but okay. So cryptography, definition of cryptography, important concepts, uh, symmetric and asymmetric hash, digital signatures, steganography and digital watermarking, and what are some of the attacks? Okay. The definition, what is cryptography? So it's a mathematical manipulation of information that prevents the information being disclosed or altered. What do we mean by that? If I want to send some data to you, right? Uh, I don't want somebody to eavesdrop, right? So I'm giving, I'm giving it to somebody to come and deliver it to you. I, want the, I don't want that person to read what the message is. So I'm changing. A simple change could be from A becomes uh, say D, B becomes E, C becomes F and whatever. And so we are hoping maybe the person who is carrying it is a 10 year old may not be able to figure out, although there are some very smart 10 year olds these days. So I am encrypting and I've already told you uh, ahead of time that I'm encrypting everything, shifting letters by three, sp three spaces. Um, and so you get the letter, uh, the person who carried it wouldn't know the meaning because he looks at it and see the F, G, H, I, K, nothing makes sense. So you get the letter and you can decode it and that's it. That's what has happened. Cryptography is a mathematical manipulation. Cryptanalysis is defecting the protected mechanisms of cryptography. So the adversary, if the person who is carrying can make a copy of it and try to break the code, okay, that's bad. Cryptology is the study of this whole area. Okay, so what's the goal? Confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, authenticity non-repudiation, access control makes compromise difficult. Authenticity, confidentiality, we know secrecy. Integrity means the data has to be accurate. Authenticity means the data is authentic. Nobody has tampered with it. Non-repudiation, you can't send a letter and say, I did not send it. Okay, because it goes in a way registered access control, and the whole idea is to make compromise difficult. Okay, so what's the process? Uh, input is called plain text or clear text. Crypto system is a device now that's encrypting, right? In, in our simple case, moving in three spaces. Cryptographic algorithms is the mathematical functions. That's the three spaces. Output is the cipher text, like A becomes D, B becomes E, and so on. Key is the crypto variable. Okay, what is, the, what is the key? Sometimes, you know, what I mentioned to you is sort of fairly straightforward, but you have a key, typically it's bits and bytes. Uh, X, Y, Z, D, uh, sorry, one, one, three, four. You apply the key together with the algorithm and the output. So that's, so the key here is essentially moving the spaces and then key clustering, two different keys cannot generate the same ciphertext, <clears throat> okay? So, you have to choose the key in such a way that whenever you have the plain text, you apply the key, it has to be one-to-one. -one. Otherwise, <clears throat> it will make it easier for the attacker to attack and get the actual data, okay? Need to choose the key in such a way to avoid key clustering. Key clustering means multiple keys will produce the same output <clears throat> and you don't want that, right? Two dif different keys cannot generate the same output. Need to make the job of the attacker as hard as possible. <clears throat> okay, 
So there are two types of cryptography. One is symmetrically key. And the, this one and the next one are very, very important. Symmetric key meaning between any two of us in this room, in the virtual room, there are 26 of you all, and I'm one, 27. So between any two of us, right, we agree upon on a key. And we use that key to communicate. So let's say there's a John, a Mary, and a Peter. John and I will have a key agreed upon and we communicate using that key. So I'll encrypt it with that key. John will decrypt it with that key. Similarly, myself and Mary, myself and Peter. John and Mary and then John and Peter. And then Mary and Peter. Okay, so look at the number of, number of keys we need, right? So we have to establish the key, but how do we establish the key first? Like I want to tell you, John, I'm going to encrypt everything three spaces, uh, shifting by three spaces, but if I tell that in an email message, somebody can eavesdrop because the, you know, before I encrypt it, right? So I can't do that. And if I, because I can't send it in, I mean, I can't give it, uh, I can't give it, uh, send it through the, the, the network because somebody can eavesdrop. I can't send it through the little boy because he, because that key is not encrypted because key is the one will tell John exactly how, how I want to encrypt it. So if the boy reads it, then he will know the key. So any message he can decrypt, right? So that's the drawback. So again, symmetric key, the cryptographic keys are both decryption and encryption. Encryption key is trivially related. So I'm saying encryption and decryption is the same key. Uh, keys in practice represent a shared secret. So between every two of us, there's a shared secret. The disadvantage is that two parties, like John and I have agreed on the key, but how do we agree? I may have to call him on the phone or something, but what if somebody is tapping me on the, tap, tapping the phone, or I have to send it to him by regular mail. What happens if the postman reads it, right? So that's the problem. That is why they develop public keys, very, very popular. And people have used public key and symmetric key together. So symmetric key between any two people, there has to be a key, one key. Public key is much simpler. Every person has two keys given by some authority, certificate authority, like very sign or whatever, right? So I have two keys, John has two keys, Mary has two keys, and Peter has two keys. There are only eight keys between us, not the many keys between every two people. Everybody has a public key that everyone knows about. So my public key is known to everyone and everyone has a private key and the private key is only known to him or her. So. Unlike symmetric key, it does not require secure initial exchange. So I'll tell you how. So asymmetric key used to create a secret private key and a published public key, private key and public key. Use of these keys allow the protection. So what I do is the following. Okay. If I want to send, remember, every public key, private key is a pair. So if I encrypt it by my public key, only my private key can decrypt it. If I encrypt it with my private key, only my public key can uh, decrypt it, okay? So I sent to John a message, uh, to all of y'all, a message, just say, with, encrypted with my private key. None of y'all know my public key. I send a message encrypted with my private key. Y'all get, all of y'all get the message. You can decrypt it with my public key, okay? So I send a message encrypted with my private key and all of y'all can decrypt it with your, with my public key because y'all know my public key. But it doesn't help confidentiality. Why? Because someone can eavesdrop, get the message. He knows or he or she knows my public key. They can decrypt it and get the message. However, John, Mary and Peter will know for sure the message is from me. So it, it provides authenticity or integrity, authenticity, because if somebody in the middle wants to, um, you know, spoil the message, right? Put some garbage, right? He can decrypt it with my public key and he can insert some garbage stuff and send it, but then it doesn't become my message anymore because he, can, he does not know my private key for him to encrypt it. He will encrypt it with his key. But when it goes to John, Peter, and Mary, they will still, they don't know who it came from. I mean, they know it 
they they know it came from me so they will have to they will have to only decrypt it with my public key but my public key will not work in that case because somebody else has tampered so john peter and mary will know that my message has been tampered and they will not trust it however okay that's for uh, authenticity but if i want confidentiality if i only want to for john to know or mary to know or peter to know what i can do is encrypt the message with their private key and i have to do it separately so it's message going to john will be encrypted with john's private key message going to mary will mary's private key message going to peter peter's private key and so somebody else cannot eavesdrop because they don't have the private so that can only be sorry sorry i made a mistake so when i want to send the message to john i know their public key i do not know their private key okay so please please excuse what i said so i will encrypt it with their public key so message to john will be encrypted with john's public key message to peter will be encrypted with peter's public key and similarly mary so somebody who's eavesdropping and getting the message cannot do anything they will have to have the corresponding private key to decrypt but they don't have the private key so only john can decrypt it for his message mary can decrypt it for her message with her private key and peter can decrypt it for his message for his private key that's the only way i can ensure confidentiality and that's what this is it allows protection of the confidentiality that means i encrypt it with the public key of the other people to ensure confidentiality and integrity i encrypt it with my private key to ensure integrity okay so think about this public key cryptography is widely used in transport level security whenever we are using even http i mean anything two people exchange and remember there is no problem here to key exchange right because we are not generating keys between two people so all the keys are being generated by who by the the key authority certificate authority right so there is no exchange between any two people everyone knows everyone's public key only uh, the person who owns the uh, private key knows about the private key and one thing though we can use this to exchange this key here right so initially we can use public key cryptography and between john and i we can have a secret conversation and exchange the key using public key right so i can i can select a key right like 1101 and if i want only john to know it i will encrypt it, encrypt it with john's public key john gets the message decrypt it with decrypts with his private key and then he gets the message and then if he agrees then great we can use the after that we can use a symmetric key so we don't have to send a you know use it by you know we don't want a phone call or message um, a regular mail so remember these pub, this cryptography thing has been around since julius caesar okay over 2000 years and those days how do they send the key by down the birds they carry the message okay so anyway it's very interesting okay initial initialization vector very briefly i'm going to tell you that the whole idea here is to make the key so complex that nobody can the adversary is trying to thwart us and get the key so we can do lots of little little i like to call it tricks but they are not tricks they are real things so i can take you know i can take a block of message separate it each message i can get some sort of initialization vector like one randomly select random number generator will select 101118 101110 and then i'll take that and apply it to the one data another vector apply it to the second block third vector apply it to the third block and then encrypt it that way so make it in harder for the adversary so that's what initialization vector okay so that's something you know we need to you know you can read up on that it's it's fairly straightforward to understand the concept but very difficult to do it digital signature is like you know signing documents like docusign uses this digital signature is a mathematical scheme for demonstrating the authenticity of a digital message a valid digital signature gives a recipient reason to believe that message was created so you public key cryptography can also use be used right i can sign it with my private key and then you all can decrypt the message okay the signature with my public key and then you all know that it's from me okay so 
So that's one way. So that's really what the digital signature, because I can't sign it and then say non-repudiation, because if I sign something and encrypt it with my, with my uh, private key, it is from me. I can't backtrack and say, because my public key can decrypt that. That's how you do your signatures. And there are other ways as well. Certificate authority, this is the, you know, very sign or whatever, right? They are the ones who assign all the certificates. Uh, CAs are characteristic of many public key infrastructures. Uh, and, you know, I do some encrypted emails when I do some, you know, communicate with the government. So then, you know, I go to VeriSign, get the certificates or global sign, whatever. So that these are the institutions, okay, that uh, provide certificates. The public key infrastructure, that's a PKI. And that is a complete system because key is not the only thing, right? I mean, that's the one part, but you have to develop software, people, policies. How long do you keep the key? When do you change the keys? How do you issue certificates? The whole process is called PKI. So you can read this. Steganography, one thing I wanted to say, difference between cryptography and steganography. Cryptography is that once you encrypt it, everything is garbage. Then you have to decrypt it to get makes sense. Steganography is that it looks really normal, you know, a lovely picture, but somewhere in there, the pixels are changing slightly, a little bit here, a little bit there. You can have coded message into regular pictures or videos. That's why those days when Osama bin Laden used to release his videos, right? Everybody starts, you know, the government agencies start looking at it to see, is there a coded message? Steganography. So everything looks great, but in there, there are coded messages. So like, for instance, when I was a little girl, my mom used to get me these, these books where like Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, the dwarfs are all hidden under the tree and on the rooftop uh, and so on. So I've got to turn it around and find those seven dwarfs. That's a form of steganography. When you look at it, it just looks beautiful. Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. You know, I mean, Snow White carrying a basket or whatever, right? I can't even remember Snow White. Right, I can't remember the, the, the story very much. Or Red Riding Hood. So it all looks really wonderful, but I can't see the, see the dwarf straight away. And then I've got to turn it around. So there's hidden messages. That's steganography. So that's a bad thing in general. But part of steganography is so similar to digital watermarking. Right, all the records, video, there is a uh, digital watermarking like signed by the owner, which is not visible to the naked eye. You can't see that. But you will say, oh, this is my music. But somebody will say, no, you downloaded it illegally. But then they run it through the steganographic tools and they say, look, this is somebody else. They can find the message. Okay, so steganography is used in a way, in a good way for digital watermarking. So please read all this and you can try and understand. Okay, so there are different types of attacks and I'm not going to go, there's a brute force, you start brute forcing one by one, one by one, and then, you know, but it takes a very long time. To break AE-256, it takes millions and millions of years, okay? Birthday attacks is you use the fact that apparently in a random group of people, I need to get this very clear, okay? Uh, at least as a fifth, oh, I, it's a birthday attack is, I think like for every 23 people, there could be, no, no. Yeah, there could be two people with the same birthday or something like that. Okay, you use that fact and then you try to do the, uh, do the, um, you know, try to decrypt, right? Or is it for every one person, there's at least someone else with the same birthday? No, it's not that, it's one of the two, okay? That's called, in a, in a group of people of 23, the chances of two people having the birthday is a certain uh, certain percentage, I think. Anyway, let, let me check that and I'll get back to you on that, okay? Birthday. Dictionary, you have all the common words in your dictionary attack. Known plain text, chosen plain text, ciphertext only, chosen ciphertext. These are some things that we can go into more detail if you want to know more about cryptography or you can read up. So if I were to explain all this, it's going to take a lot of time, but just to know that these attacks are there. Brute force is where you keep on, you know, uh, trying different things, but it's, it takes a very, very long time. Okay, so now we go to number three. So let's see how are we doing with time. 
Uh, right, we are just finished one hour. So I think we are doing well. We can finish it in two hours because a lot of the latter stuff after access control, this is the major module. A lot of the others I can finish very quickly. Okay, so access control is important. So whatever I've covered, the, the governance, we are not going to go into it too much. The architecture part is useful, but cryptography and especially access control is really key. Access control is a system which enables an authority to control access and restores in a given physical facility. So any data, you know, you have to access the data. So initially access control started with, uh, you know, going into a building, you need a card, a comet card. You use a comet card and get into UTD. That's an act form of access control. Immediately a card goes into uh, some system controlling, you know, looks at the policies and sees, do we have access? And then we are granted access. But we are talking about controlling access to files, okay? Uh, measures of physical devices, biometric, all these are all part of access control. You can read this, uh, social barriers, okay. In access control model, the entities that can be performed, we are interested that for this, the people, the users are called subjects. And the data, the files, and so on, databases are called objects. So what access does the subject have to an object? Read, write, execute, typically. So one way to do access control, uh, they fall into one or two, access control lists and capability lists. Capability list today is also called credentials when it, talks, when it comes to people. So let's look at the capability list. Capability list says that every process has got some capabilities, just like every person has credentials. I am a professor, or you are a student, you are a high school student, so you have capabilities, I have capabilities, I have credentials, okay? So similarly, these processes, right, they have some capabilities. A process P1 can execute uh, uh, a file F1, a process P2 can read into a file F, process P1 can read into a file F2, a process P1 can write into a file F3. Okay, so that's the capability it has. And you can have a capability list. Every process has certain capabilities, what it can read, write, and execute. Similarly, access control models, access control list is the opposite. Every object, that is every file, who can do what? So I have a file F. Process P1 can read file F. Process P2 can write into file F. Process P3 can execute file F. Okay, so that is an access control matrix. Who can do what on the object? Capability, I'm a process. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm a process, I'm a subject. Which the sub, okay. So, sorry, for capability, I'm a subject. What can I do with respect to these objects? That's the capability. Access is conveyed to another party by transmitting a capability. So how do you come up with these access control policies? You've got to transmit the capabilities in ACL-based model. A subject's access to object depends on the identity and so on. Who is the subject, okay? So the first thing you do, identification, authentication, authorization. You go into a system, You've got to identify yourself, user ID, authentication, password. Once you do that, then the system will tell you all the policies. You can read into this file, execute this file, write into, that's the authorization. What can I do? And then accountability, you need to have a history. I can't go and steal something and later say, I didn't go into that machine. Everything is accountable, okay? So you can't say later, no, I didn't do it, okay? So identification, authentications are commonly based on something you know, that's the PIN or the password, right? Identification number. This assumes that only the owner of the account knows the password. Something you have, I can have a smart card or a security token. So like, for instance, I use another machine uh, and there I have like a, you know, I have this uh, RSA security token here, right? A security token. Okay, that is a smart card. And then uh, uh, this assumes that only the owner of the account, yeah, something you have, smart card, something you are, biometric, fingerprint, voice, retina, iris. And we have, bio, we have phone numbers. We have got uh, text, texting to our email, something you, 
something you, uh, that could be maybe part of this, right? Something you have, phone. Anyway, we are doing multi-factor authentication, right? It's multiple things. Where, where you are, location also, you know, you can only access from a certain location, right? So that's also where you are. Okay, so authorization, so continuing, authorization is what we study a lot, right? Authorization determines what a subject can do onto a system. Most modern operating systems define sets of permissions that are variations or external extensions of three basic types, reading, writing, and executing. Okay, writing could be adding, creating, deleting, renaming. Reading is just read the files, execute, execute the files. Okay, now comes an interesting part. This is this a single sign-on, particularly something called Kerberos. This was implemented at MIT, I think, 30 years ago, and we're all using it. When we sign into UTD, right, until all these multi-factor things came, you know, came into play, we just log in with our user, log in user ID and password, and you can access every piece of uh, thing, right? You can go to e-learning, you can do this, you can do that. So single sign-on, sign only once, and with this property, user logs in and once and gains access to all the system systems and so on. He doesn't have to log in, he or she. Single sign off is a reverse. Once you sign off, you sign off from all systems. As different applications and resources are support different authentication mechanisms, single sign on has to internally translate and store. Okay, we can I can talk about the last point later. But anyway, Kerberos is the most popular single sign on developed at MIT. Uh, design same primary client server model, Kerberos as a protocol. It builds on symmetric key cryptography between any two entities. There has to be a key. It can also use public key, but it uses a symmetric key, okay? So what does it do? So Kerberos has, it uses a very, very, this was developed at the University of Cambridge, Needham Schroeder protocol. It makes use of a trusted third party. That's a key distribution center who is distributing the keys. So KDC, the key distribution center has two parts, authentication server and ticket granting server. Kerberos works based on tickets. So before you do anything, you have to show your ticket. Before you go to your movie theater, you should show your ticket or a token. So Kerberos uses ticket. Okay, how does it work? The KDC maintains a database of secret keys. Each entity on the network, whether it's a client or a server, everybody, right? It shares a secret key known only to itself and to the K KDC. So everybody has a secret key. Knowledge of this key serves to prove an identity's, entity's identity. So you can think of it maybe even as a private key, but they're not calling it private key here. Okay, every, every one of us is given a secret key. A communication between two entities. So I have my secret key. That's, that's what I use to identify myself with the KDC. So it's a slightly different from public key. So a communication, if I want to use a database, my client process wants to use a database server or wants to print something. KDC generates a session key, which we can use, right? So which they can use to secure their interaction. So be between any two people, any two entities, there has to be a session key. The security of the protocol relies heavily on participants maintaining loosely synchronized time and short-lived transactions. The session key is assigned in such a way it's not there forever. For one time use, I can use my session to do my printing. Next time I have to get another session key, okay? So the client authenticates itself to the authentication server. That's the other part, right? That's a KDC has got authentication server and ticket granting server. Ticket granting server gives all the tickets. Authentication server, uh, client, so I've got my ticket right from the, so I've got to authenticate, uh, the client authenticates itself to the authentication server and I get a ticket. All tickets are timestamped. It then contacts the ticket granting server, the other part, and using the ticket, say, oh, look, I'm authenticated. Okay. It demonstrates its identity and asks for a service. If the client is eligible for the service, then the ticket granting server sends another ticket to the client. The client then contacts the server, service server right? And I can use that ticket and it can sign it to know for sure. There's some way to know for sure that it came in a legitimate fashion from a ticket granting server. And then I can show that to the other 
you know, database server or whatever, and then I can get access. So it's a little bit confusing The you know, I, I mean, there's a lot of intricacies, right? KDC maintains a database of secret keys. Each entity on the network, whether a client or a server, shares a secret key only to itself and to the KDC, okay? Knowledge of this key serves to prove the entity's identity. So I have this key and that is my identity. So then I authenticate separately with the authentication server. But whenever I want to get any other uh, uh, tickets from the KDC to talk to all these other servers, database, mail server, and printing server, and so on, I have to show my identity and I'm authenticated. So I have to show the key that I got from the KDC and the authentication key from the authenticating server. And based on that, I will get another key to talk to the, another ticket actually, to talk to the various database servers. So this is the, this is the protocol. It's a little bit complex, but when you think about it, it's not that. Okay, so that's what we are all using. Okay, the drawbacks is that single point of failure, right? If the authentication server and the ticket granting server collapse, then you can't do, you are, you're stuck. And it requires clocks to synchronize and sometimes clocks are way off in the system, right? So they have to be synchronized. I mean, when I get a uh, ticket, it is time stamped, and I have to get it done within a certain time uh, otherwise, it's too late. So these are some of the problems that you have with Kerberos. Okay, and there are various variations that have been proposed. Okay, now we come to a very important part of access control. Uh, what are the various types of access control? There's discretionary, where it's given at the discretion of the user. So John has, so owner of the data, right? The owner of the data can grant access. I have a piece of, I, I own a database. So I can say that Peter has read access, John has write access and so on. That's discretionary. Anything else is non-discretionary. So discretionary is DAC. Mandatory access control is called MAP, mandatory access control, okay? And a special type of mandatory access, and that's the one, the military type access control, Bell and La Pedula. A special type of mandatory access control is called RBAC, role-based access control. Here again, it's mandatory because depending on your roles, if you are a professor, you can do certain things. If you are a secretary, you can do certain other things. If you are a student, you can do certain other things. But depending on your role, it's mandated. Similarly, the earlier thing, the mandatory access, sorry, depending on your role, it's non-discretionary. It's not so there's discretionary, non-discretionary. Among non-discretionary, you have mandatory access control. That's a military type, unclassified, secret, top secret. Another thing is called role-based. That is depending on your role. It's not at the discretion of a owner of the data. Okay, we are going to talk a lot of role-based access control. More recently, we have attribute-based in the web environment, cloud environment. RBAC is very good for a for an organization. In fact, many commercial products have implemented RBAC, role-based. But now we go to ABAC. In the ABAC system, right, in the cloud is and web services, they use ABAC. Every person has got credential. So I had the credential, credential of having been a professor. Um, you know, I have credentials of being, you know, various certifications or various qualifications and various other things. And so I present my credentials to the cloud or to the service provider. And credentials are, credentials are these attributes. And based on that, access is granted. Sometimes, you know, you've got to be older than 18. So it's not just to access data, even to go to a movie theater right or to get a cigarette i think right you've got to be older than 18 or older than 21 i don't know so you get to show your driver's license and various credentials and then you can access you can get a job that way right you go and present your credentials and get the job that's why attribute based access control is the most popular access control now okay so dac is access policy determined by the owner owner decides who to give access to Two important uh, concepts, file and data ownership. Every object in the system has an owner. In most DAC systems, each, of each object's initial owner is a subject that caused it to be created, right? The owner creates the object and the owner gives access rights. ACL or capability-based, whatever the system, okay? Mandatory access control is the military, right? Mac, I showed earlier, right? Star property for reading, sorry, for writing, uh, 
simple property for reading. And so there's level of trust. I'm going to talk later about trust as well. Okay, not so that's the types of access control, which is MAC. And then role-based access control, as I said, depending on the roles, access is given. I've already explained, you know, role of a professor, role of a student. Okay. So these are the types of access control. Now, remember, controlling access, access control policies, there's also biometrics. So very briefly, I'm going to talk about biometrics. Biometrics are automated methods, recognition, right, handwriting, fing facial, fingerprinting, iris, uh, voice, retina, and then there's also physiologic, sorry, sorry, psychological, the way you walk and so on, the gait. It can be used to access control to data in the system or medical, financial, childcare, who is taking care of your children, computer access, right? So biometric has become really important. Okay, biometric can be used for computer access or to come into the United States, US visit, it uses biometric. Provides better security, more convenient, better accountability, okay? Applications on fraud detection and for fraud det deterrence, right? And dual purpose, you can use it for cybersecurity, national security to control people coming into the coming into the building, or you know, you can recognize are they suspicious, are they not, all kinds of stuff. They recognize the features, they are in the terrorist list. Okay. So what is the process? Three steps: capture process verification. So you take a raw biometric like fingerprint, right? And you capture it, it converts into mathematical representations right, the biometric records. So they create templates, a lot of mathematics involved. And then you store the template, you can either verify or identify. So matching the enrolled biometric sample. So, uh, uh, so matching the end, so you get a biometric sample, you've got all these templates in the, in the database, you compare, okay? So, you, so, so that is verification. Is the person who is claiming him to be, right? Because that person is already in the database, you match to see, is he matching, he or she matching? That's the, uh, that's the verification. Identification is that you don't know, a person is coming in, you don't know whether he or she is in the database. You want to do a search and to see, you want to identify him or her, right? So that's the two things that, uh, that we do, right? Capturing, verification of the person, identifying the person. Uh, why biometrics? Uh, you know, user ID, passwords, and so on. It's kind of, huh, right? It's not very easy. Password mechanisms have vulnerabilities, stealing passwords, biometrics are less prone to attacks, right? Sophisticated techniques, cannot, you cannot steal one's facial features. Biometric systems are more convenient, uh, need, need not have multiple passwords, you don't need tokens, better accountability, and so on. However, all is not great, all is not good. Biometrics could be attacked. Right, somebody can pretend to be you, pre present a fake biometric, right, such as a synthetic biometric, uh, submit a previously intercepted biometric data, you steal your data and then put it again. You know, somebody, uh, attacker can go and take the uh, template and then put the template again, right? Compromising the feature extractor, you can modify those feature extractors and then uh, attacker can, can all cause chaos, replace a genuine feature. Uh, by fake values, produce a high number of matching results, attack the template, add templates, modify templates, and so on. And sometimes they say uh, they cut off the person's finger and then use that for the biometric. It's so horrible, right? But the thing is that you have to also check to see is the finger a live finger or a dead finger? Oh gosh, it's, it's horrible thoughts. Okay, so biometric verification, I, told, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, verification, user claims an identity, user provides a biometric data, system tries to match is he, does he, is he, who is, he or she, who he's, he or she is claiming to be? Identify, user does not claim an identity, gives a biometric data, and then you identify the person. Okay. And then the biometric process, user, I mean, user enrolls, I talked about it. Data is converted into a template, lots of mathematics and linear algebra and so on. And then verification, identification. Okay. So, and then the confidence level, how confident, just like machine learning, it's a type of machine learning. How confident are you with a, with a result, right? There could be false positives and false negatives. That's the problem, right? And, and accuracy, false positives, false negatives, accuracy. 
Of course, there's finger scan, voice scan, face scan, iris scan, all types of biometrics, even signature keystroke. Okay, so that is biometrics. Okay, so now we go into very briefly another type of access control is intrusion detection prevention. And by the way, uh, intrusion is in a maliciously, somebody can intrude into your system, a person or a malware, right? So the networks could be attacked, the host of the system could be attacked. You have network-based intrusion. You have host-based intrusion, right? So what do you do? And so later on, I'm going to talk in detail in another unit about the algorithms for intrusion detection, OK? We use machine learning slash data mining for intrusion detection. So typically, most of the work is detecting any intrusions. But it would be nice if you can apply machine learning and say, oh, oh Okay, these are the sorts of things that these people are attacking. Maybe they are going to attack at some time in the future. And so let's try to catch them. Okay, or let's try to prevent them from coming into the system by honey patching, by doing all kinds of, you know, luring them. And, you know, there is various, you know, various other things to prevent. And I'll talk about that another time. Okay. Threats to access control, there's dictionary attack, brute force, spoofing at login, phishing, identity theft. So I'll have a lecture later on talking entirely about attacks. Okay, network security. I'm going to now, from this point onwards, we have about 30 charts. It's going to be like a very quickly, okay, because my lectures are going to be focusing more on access control, on malware, on machine learning. These are some of the topics. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about IoT. So introduction to network security, types of security, secure network systems, secure network protocols, network forensics, and so on. So network security, all I'm saying here is that when you move data from one place to another, it goes through a network, that network has to be secure. You can't have unauthorized access. You could have, you have to authenticate the user to use the network. Then you, there are firewalls around right today i was using my pop3 machine and let's see it said uh, there is a firewall that is preventing from just a second i want to make sure if uh from getting to the system so i had a bit of a problem today uh okay it's okay now right so firewalls uh, though effective to prevent unauthorized access this component may fail to check potentially harmful because so firewalls are all good you know, but some of the viruses and worms and so on, malware, we use the common name now, malware, that malware may not be caught, okay, even though we have firewalls. So we need antivirus software and so on, okay, so that's what they are saying. So communication between two hosts using a network could be encrypted. So encryption is very important for networks. Honeypots, okay, it's, I don't know whether it's quite, we wanted to develop some honeypot potting. Uh, about 10 years ago, and UTD said no, because that's a problem. We, we, we essentially have a decoy, okay? So what we do is we have like a fake system set up, and then people will be flocking into that system, so we will know immediately, catch them while they are doing it, and have a fake system, honeypot, right? So uh, essentially decoy network accessible resources could be deployed in the network as surveillance and early warning tools. And that's sometimes people get concerned. They can sue you saying that they, you entice them, okay? And that's not, that could be, you know, they could take us to court for that. Techniques used by the attackers that attempt to compromise these decoy resources are studied during and after an attack, right? Such analysis could be used to further provide security. And then there's also botnet. Is a, there's another type of network botnet, like a master and slave. So I'm sort of, like I could be the master, I've got several people working for me, all these slaves, bots, and the bots, I'll tell the bots, unleash the bots where they can go and do all kinds of crazy things. Very, very bad. Term is most commonly associated with malicious software. Okay, intrusion detection, I'm gonna talk in more detail. Hosts could be attacked, networks could be attacked, right? There could be anomalies. That means anything that is not normal is abnormal. So every time I check my, I work till about two, three o'clock and I wake up around eight, nine o'clock. So if I wake up at six o'clock and check emails, you'll never find me. So that's abnormal. So people might think that uh, it's an anomaly. However, it could be a new normal. It so happens that one day I would have woken up at six o'clock. So there are problems. 
misuse is that we have all the bad stuff, all the bad attacks, attack types, patterns. And if it's not bad, then it has to be good, right? So that's, that's not correct either because just because it's not bad, there could be a new bad instance. So capture all the activities, lots of data. So, so one model that we developed, I'm, I have a, another lecture, I'm going to talk about it in detail. Um, so what we do is with emails, let's see. Right, so very briefly, we take all the ongoing emails, outgoing emails, we extract all the features, typical machine learning, right? Either Nive Bayesian or support vector machine or any other machine learning. And then we train, 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 and then we build a model. And later, a test data comes in. We already have the model, apply the model. So model is learned, you know, uh, take the test data. So we build, see, we all the emails, we do the training data and we build the model, the classifier, then test data comes in, we test to see, is it clean or infected? So we use machine learning. So for my lectures, I use machine learning and data mining interchangeably, started with data mining and today machine learning is the biggest word, right? So now we call it machine learning, okay. First started with machine learning, then went to data mining and back to machine learning. Uh, firewall systems also, let's see. Uh, what, I'm, what I want to stay, say here is the group of systems that enforces access control policy between two networks. So you say inside the firewall, outside the firewall, right? Implements access control across networks, maintains logs that can be analyzed, data mining for analysis. So we have applied data mining machine learning to analyze the firewall logs to see anything happen. Limitations, there is no, so within the network, we, inside the firewall, there's not much that we can do, but firewalls will, pre will prevent some kinds of, you know, coming from port 80. We say P-O-R-T 80 could be a faulty, a malicious port. So then it'll stop that message from coming, right? So that's the firewall. So what we have done is look at all the firewall. I just very briefly, I won't go into it much. We take all of the firewall log files, we mine the files. And so what we are trying to do is firewall, log files are so huge that we try to reduce the number of data and apply machine learning and data mining. Uh, so there is a bridge, the gap between what is written in the firewall policy rules and what is being observed. And network traffic trend may show that some rules are out of outdated. So there's so many rules that we try to throw away. So this is not very relevant right now, but I just threw it in there. So don't worry too much about this. Okay, so now we move to another topic in network security, the OSI model, Open Systems Interconnection. When I got into networks, it's a st international standard, OSI, and that's what we study. There is a net seven layer network, physical layer, data link layer, network layer, and routers and so on. And then you go to the transport layer, session layer, and then the application layer, okay? That is the OSI, but of course what we use now, TCP, right, and IP, transport uh, control protocol and IP internet protocol, right? Transport control protocol, and then you have an unreliable protocol. So these are the protocols, nothing to do with security yet, session layer, and then your presentation layer, right? You can do some encryption, and then you have the application layer, all these applications. What do we do? From a security point of view, we got to secure all these layers. Okay, so net, if you take a course in network security, how do you secure a session layer? How do you secure the transport layer? How do you secure the physical data network layers, right? So, and I'm not going to talk too much about it. Uh, TCP IP is very popular now. So we are not, nobody, hardly anyone uses OSI except in schools to teach. When I was studying in grad school, we were talking about OSIs, but now everything is TCP IP, right? TCP IP uh, is a transport layer and the internet protocol. So instead of the transport layer that you have here, right, we are using TCP. Instead of the internet layer, remember, network layer, we are using IP, okay, internet protocol. And we are now IPv6, version 6, because IPv4 was very popular, right? So anyway, you can read pretty much uh, what happens here. And then IPv4, these are the properties of IPv4. And I'm not going to, because this, this, this is something I'm not going to talk about in the lectures, 
but this is something you can, and I'll tell you later next Friday on the 17th, the first lecture, what we can expect. Uh, IPv4 is an internet protocol, right? It's a version four, it's a little bit outdated. People are still using it though. Okay, and now we're very popular is IPv6, eventually we'll have V7 and so on, right? So these are the two things for internet. Okay, so we started with OSI in the 80s, migrated to TCP IP, that is the internet protocol, right? The World Wide Web. Underneath you go down into the World Wide Web, they use TCP IP. That's why it's so popular, okay? Uh, and then of course, Internet protocol has to be secure. And this chart shows how do you secure the internet protocol, okay? Uh, it's a protocol suite for securing the IP. Uh, IPsec includes protocols for establishing mutual authentication between agents. So uh, IPsec can be used to protect data flows. It's a dual mode, so it matches. IP matches to network layer in the OSI model. Right, so it shows how they are mapping and what needs to be secured. It's not talking about how, and as I said, I'm not going to go into any further details on this at this moment. So, this after the, the transport layer, right, that is the OSI, but here what we are using now the TCP IP, right, transport control protocol. So, we are using something called TLS, as it used to be SSL secure socket layer, but now they have incorporated some of this into TLS and transport layer security. That's what we have. At the transport layer, TLS, right, transport layer security will provide all the security. So IPsec and transport layer security are the ones on top of that, what do we build? HTTPS. HTTPS, hypertext transfer the security protocol, uses TLS and IPsec, just like, just like HTTP uses uh, transport layer, TCP IP, right? But here it uses TCP, uh, TLS and IPsec. Okay, DMZ, it's a, between North Korea and South Korea, there's a part uh, where it's a safe zone, right? Where both parties, when they meet, they go to the DMZ, demilitarized zone. So similarly, whenever you have all these servers, you have the firewall and you have the outside network, right? There is a demilitarized zone. The purpose of DMZ is to add an additional layer of security to the organization's land. So it's outside the firewall, inside the outside, beyond the outside network. And it's a sort of an area where, like a peacekeeping, where you can do further checks. That's what DMZ is used. Because when you are in the DMZ zone, neither party can attack you, North Korea or South Korea. But once you're crossing into North Korea, you could get attacked, or you cross into South Korea, you might get attacked, right? So that's the, that's the purpose of DMZ, okay? VPN, virtual private network. So you're at home and you want to use the internet, public telecom telecommunication infrastructure, we know that that's not secure. So what do you do? in using various protocols, you can build a tunnel. You can build a secure tunnel to UTD. I'm sure you guys use VPN. I do have VPN also. So we use VPN and do all kinds of secure communication. That's a virtual private network, okay? Okay, now, just like digital forensics, you can also have network forensics, right? Networks can be analyzed uh, and then digital forensics, so I'll talk about network forensics. Uh, what you can do is catch it as you can systems and stop, look at, and listen systems, right? Catch it as you can in which all packets passing through a certain traffic point and captured and written to storage with analysis being done subsequently. So you can't get every packet and check. <coughs> so what do you do? Send it all to storage and then check it later. Has an attack occurred? But stop, look, and listen, what do you do? Every time you see the internet, right? Every time you see, sorry, every time you have a packet, you stop and listen and check it. And that takes time. So uh, we've done a lot of work on digital forensics. Maybe I might give a lecture on that as well. Uh, so 
IDS, okay, NFAT, Network Forensics Tools. So it's between intrusion detection and firewalls and network forensics. So usually forensics, just like the name implies, after you die, right? Forensic investigation is carried out for a person. Similarly, what happens with forensics is that you intrusion is sort of a thin line in the sense intrusion detection is you check for intrusions, right? But forensics is when the system has crashed, somebody has attacked the system or something horrible has happened, then everything is crashed and you have to come back and figure out what happened to the system. You carry out an investigation. Who done it? Who did it? That is the forensics. Okay, so for network forensics, we had to capture the network traffic, we had to analyze the traffic. So uh, network traffic forensics is part of digital forensics. And I'll try and have a lecture for you all, maybe if I have time on digital forensics. There's so many things I want to discuss, and we will talk about a plan next Friday. So please, uh, if you can listen to this before you come next Friday, then we can discuss this and go on to talk about some other questions and what I'm expecting for you all to do in the class. Okay. So I talked about honeypots, honey nets, honey nets for networks, honeypots. Network forensics and honey net systems uh, had the same features, right? Honey net can, you want to lure the attackers by telling them this is a great, I mean, showing this system, but it's a fake system, right? So network forensic systems and analyze and reconstruct the attack. So you have been attacked, what do you do? You don't know who did it. So you create a honey net and then for the network and attack, uh, attacker will come again, then you catch it. Or you can do forensics later, right? So you can do one or the other or both, catch the attacker and then take the, uh, so you have two machines, right? The honey net and the original network. So then you can analyze the, or while you are analyzing the original network, you can also attract, okay? Entice the attacker to come and then catch him while he is attacking or he or she is attacking. Okay, and similarly, honeypots is for a system, a fake system. Okay, next steps, of course, cloud security. That's a, a big thing we are going to talk about, right? Cloud computing, again, instead of having 1,000 machines in your organization, you can rent a cloud and you can get machine service, you can get all the programming software, you can uh, get application support. So cloud essentially provides services right, for the organization. And we are going to go into a lot of depth with the cloud. Okay, now we have about 10 charts left, 11 charts, okay? So how are we doing with time? Yes, we are, remember I told you about two hours, we can finish it in slightly less than two hours. Right, legal and forensics. So I talked about all the key points. Now these things, as we go, we can elaborate on them in future lectures, okay? Legal is anything to do with lawyers including forensics, because you carry out a digital forensics, you can't accuse somebody he attacked or she attacked, you've got to go to court and, <clears throat> and argue it out in front of a judge and maybe a jury with the lawyers on the defense side. So a lot of legal issues, incident management, data privacy is part of it, computer forensics and compliance, okay? So legal issues has got jurisdiction, law, economics, international cooperation between multiple countries, intellectual property theft, all that is discussed here. Okay, privacy, again, personally identifiable information, privacy laws and regulations, international privacy, privacy law examples, <coughs> health insurance, portability and accountability, um, you know, so that's, I, I'm, I'm, I will have some lectures on privacy. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, health insurance, portability and accountability, personal ident information protection, various privacy directives, right? So the whole idea is how do you protect the privacy? There's a technical side, there's a social side, and there's a legal side. Okay, so that's protecting the private personally identifiable information. Digital forensics, I talked about it, right? You collect the evidence. Uh, there's a chain of custody. You know, it's just like, you know, you go, you follow, you know, those CSI shows and so on. They say the, for, the evidence is contaminated, like contaminated blood. You can't leave evidence contaminated. You've got to lock it up. You can also encrypt the evidence so that nobody is tampering with it, right? And so you have to then collect the evidence, prepare a report, right? And then you go to court. <clears throat> compliance, some key aspects, 
various legislations, uh, you know, the government, the lawyers, I mean, the law enforcement people, the Congress, right? They enact the laws. Sabe in Soxley, it's, uh, it's, it's all to do with the data. Uh, you know, Sabe in Soxley actually came after Enron scandal. So all the corporate governance issues. So Sabe, Sabe in Soxley plays an important part. Uh, there's another regulation, Graham Lee, Bailey, and so on. And then you've got to also audit uh, the companies, uh, you know, being compliant with all the regulations. So all that is compliance. And I'm not going to go further. Other aspects of security. Remember, I said business continuity planning, operation security, physical security, and this is my area. So much of our focus is going to be on this later on. So business continuity, essentially, after the organization uh, is attacked, hurricane, cyber attack, whatever, they have to continue with the business. But you can't suddenly say, OK, how do we continue? You've got to prepare. So that's the business impact analysis and functional requirements. So you've got to carry out a business impact analysis, right? And continuously revise the plan, develop a strategy, devise a plan, do some testing, do some implementation, just say that suddenly everything has crashed. You purposely make things crash just to make sure the backup site has got everything organized. Okay, because you can't really wait for a for a hurricane or a cyber attack to happen. You've got to be prepared and feedback and plan and then revise the plan. So that's planning for the business. Physical security, you have to look at site and facility, perimeters. Uh, protecting against fires, hurricanes, HVAC, heating, ventilation, what happens if you are a fire, right? Uh, again, they say people first, protect the lives of the people, then your computers and the resources. Okay, that's physical security. And building how tall should the fences be, bollards, where do you place the bollards, all to do with physical. Operation security, day-to-day -day security, right? What are the patches? How do you protect resources? Continuity of the operations, uh, patch management, what sort of storage devices, all part of operation security. While business continuity planning is you plan for any potential problems, uh, operation security is a day-to-day -day management. Database applications, and this is what we are going to talk about, securing the databases, securing the application, system lifecycle, social media systems. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about social media security, access control models, uh, secure software development, secure software engineering, cloud error, cl coding errors and malware attacks. Okay, a lot of this I've already given, provided the lectures. So I will send you all the links, right? So today I will, this is the, this lecture is the first time I'm recording. Okay, so I'm going to put this on YouTube, uh, hopefully tonight. Okay, then that's database, right? Application errors, right? Buffer overflow, cross-site cross scripting, dangling pointer, invalid. And I'm going to talk about it in more detail, right? So everything in this part, I'm going to discuss in more detail. SQL, in, so malware, so that's coding errors, right? Buffer overflow, the errors that you make while developing software. So there's a whole area called secure coding or secure programming, secure programming. Then malware's SQL injection. They come and take the SQL queries, modify it to delete all your databases. File execution, denial of service, hijacking, phishing. Okay, these are the real threats that we have that we've got to be terrified about. So this is 95, okay, last one. Essentially, what I've done, right? So we, what we, what we talked today, we talked about information security, risk management, architecture, cryptography, access control. These four things I explained, went into some depth. It's the background. Then I just skimmed through telecommunications, legal, physical. Telecommunications maybe a little bit more like network security, legal, physical, business continuity planning, operations. Then, although I skimmed through database security, right? It's something that we are going to focus on over the next several lectures. I talk about machine learning and security, social media security. So several topics I will be discussing, right? Okay. We have not talked yet about cloud computing, social media, trustworthy machine learning, secure internet of things. So these are the lectures that we will be focusing. Some I've already gotten stuff there and some not. So I'm going to send this to you for you to prepare. After that, every Friday, I'm going to give you all 
over the weekend, I'll be sending more lectures and more links. So we will definitely meet next Friday and I'm going to send, to send you all the invite and ask Dr. J to send you all the, you know, set the links up. Uh, so next Friday, I said one to two uh, central, two to three Eastern. The following Friday, actually, I got to go for a meeting to New York. Uh, so we, I, but I don't, I don't want to miss it though, right? So I might have some, I'm going to record the lectures too, so y'all can listen to it. So if we don't meet on Friday, I'm going to organize something on that Monday, right? So 22nd, if, I, if you are going to miss it on the 22nd, uh, sorry, not 22nd, 24th, then I can, I'll try and have something maybe on the 28th and then on July 1st. Okay, same thing will happen July 8th. So I'm going to, only two Fridays I will miss. Other Fridays I will be here because July 8th, I will be in Dallas, but I've got a, a doctor, my eye appointment, so I really don't want to miss that. But I'll make sure that once a week I'm meeting with you. Our meetings are to discuss the lectures and the meet. So you're only one hour, maybe maximum one and a half hours meetings are dis to discuss your programming project, right? So I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, so let's see. So it took us about one hour and 25 and 20, 45 minutes, right? So, and I kind of rushed a little bit because I, you know, I just wanted to talk about the essential stuff. So anyway, so what I'm saying is, uh, Right, because y'all are going to do a programming project for class if y'all want to do, and we also have to figure out, you know, uh, I'd rather y'all work in teams, 26 of y'all, work in teams and do a programming project, okay? If y'all want to opt out and then write a paper, but it has to be a fairly extensive paper on something, okay? But you will get more benefits by doing a programming project. Sometimes you might get a little bit uh, intimidated with programming, but please try because, and I can give you all several suggestions uh, to do your projects. So we can talk about that. So next week is when we will have our first day of class and then we will discuss all that, okay? And again, thank you very much for listening. And I will post this on YouTube and I will send you all the link, okay? Thank you very much and see you on June 17th at 1 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Okay, thank you very much and bye everyone.